So yes, my name is Trevor, and I am on staff with yes, I am on staff with Kai Alpha here at Sam Houston. Uh, my wife was actually the woman who just got up, Pat. So she is wonderful. We've been married now for three years, or three years in December. So it's coming up, our anniversary. Um, and I have been here at Sam Houston for a total of 11 years. Now, I promise I did graduate, and I have a diploma somewhere hidden in our house. It's so hidden, I don't know where it is. Hopefully my wife knows. I have no idea. I had a history degree, yes, which makes me sound like an intellectual to people outside of the U.S., but here it's, you don't, yeah, that's okay. But I have been on staff with Kyle for the past five years. And I just want to say thank you so much for being here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now tonight, maybe you're here because Jordan Odones, he convinced you that you had to come, and he's like, no, you're coming. Or maybe you're here because Landon, the first Sam Houston rugby game is this Saturday at 6 p.m. Or maybe you met my friend Cooper and you, at contact table, and you thought, she's pretty cool, I'll hang out with her. And... Either way, for what, whatever reason you're here, thank you so much for coming and being part of this thing. What's that? Uh-oh. All right. And just so you know, that this is definitely the best Chi Alpha group in the nation. Well, the best one I've ever been a part of. So, yeah. <laughs> hey, so last week, we got to hear from Jason Goldsberry. And the message he spoke, it challenged my own heart on not being entangled in civilian affairs, but being about the kingdom of God, about being part of his mission, his purposes. It was awesome, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. But if you'll remember, we have a sermon series on the parables of Jesus happening this fall semester. And two weeks ago, we heard from our own Sam Pitt, who asked us this philosophical question, what is the purpose of life? What is the purpose of life? But there's another question he asked also, and it's one that I have to constantly ask myself. And it's, why do I do the things I do, and who do I do them for? Why do I do the things I do, and who do I do them for? I need to check my motives. I need to check my intentions. And Sam did such a phenomenal job of, of pointing that out. And if you'll remember, he proceeded to take us through two different parables. The parable of the rich fool and the treasure hidden in the field. Well, tonight, I needed to one-up him. So instead of going over two parables, we're going to go over three this week. <laughs> kind of. We'll see. Now, primarily, we are going to be in the book of Luke, chapter 15 tonight. So if you have a Bible with you, or you have a Bible on your phone, then feel free to go ahead and go to that chapter. But it will be up on the screen. All right. Now, before I go any further, let me pray for us that we will hear from God tonight. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. God, I thank you, Lord, for everything you've done in my own heart, my life, and everything you've done this semester so far, Father God. I thank you for each and every single man and woman in this room, Father. Lord Jesus, I ask that you would speak to them tonight. I ask that you would speak through me, Father God, that, it, Lord, it wouldn't just be my own words, my own thoughts, but they would be, it would be yours. And, Lord, that your heart would be shown through all of this. We love you, Lord God, and we are so grateful for you. Amen. 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 So, yeah, this chapter of Luke 15 has a few distinct sections throughout it. And my Bible even has these sections labeled as three different parables here. The lost sheep, the lost coin, and the prodigal son. Now I've read quite a few different commentaries on these three stories and all of them agree that these three form a sort of trilogy that go together. That there's a core thought that runs through all of them. That you can't take two, one out of, the t out of the three and just have the two. You need all three there together. And that actually some of them would say, that all three of these are actually one parable together. Now, whether or not they're one or they're three, I don't know, but I can agree that these three are together. And the first two of these three pictures, or three parables, are much shorter than the third one. So I'm going to spend some time there on those two, but the bulk of our time together will be on the, thir on the third part of this passage and how they correspond with one another. I like to think that these two are the appetizers of chips and queso, and the beef fajitas are still on the way. You, you can't... You can't have it without, without the others. You know what I mean? Yeah, oh, yeah. Hey, let's read. It says this, verse 1 of chapter 15 of Luke. The tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees 
and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. And so Jesus told them this story. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. And when he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. And the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over ninety-nine others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. Let me repeat that last part. There is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. Let me continue. It says, Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Now won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she does find it, she will call in her friends and neighbors and say, Rejoice with me because I have found my lost coin. And in the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. Let me repeat that last part again. In the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. Now you'll notice in both of these stories that something has been lost, and the person who owns that thing has gone out to look for it. The shepherd for his lost sheep and the woman for her lost coin. In both stories, let me tell you, the emphasis isn't actually on the thing lost, but on the one who went to look for the lost thing and the joy that came to their hearts from that reunion. Now, I don't know anything about sheep other than they can be really dumb and can get lost very, very easily. But my friends, Harley and Avery, where are y'all at? Y'all here? You're here, right there. You both work at a daycare nursery, right? What if one of the kids went missing? while you were there. It would be bad, right? Oh, man, I'd be freaking out. Instantly, I'm sure, Harley, that you are going to be looking for them. You're going to stop everything. You're going to be looking. Imagine for you guys the fear and the anxiety of when the kids went missing. How much more so for all of us if it was our own child that went missing? I'm not even a dad yet, but that scares me. But imagine the relief whenever you do find them. Maybe they were just playing behind the playground in the sand and they probably didn't even know they were missing, but you knew. It's like, come here, you're coming in. I also don't know much about coins, but my friend Sebastian knows quite a bit about them. He actually has a pretty, pretty large collection of different coins. He told me that his, lo- his most valuable coin is an 1875 trade dollar. It was one of the coins that started your collection. Sebastian, you'd be sad if you lost it, wouldn't you? And you'd be searching for it. Oh, yeah. Now, a lot of the authors I read while prepping for tonight agree that this missing coin wasn't just a, a coin, that it was actually part of the woman's wedding attire, that somehow she would have the ten coins somewhere in her veil w- that at the wedding ceremony. And to lose one was almost the equivalent of losing all of them. You just couldn't go without it. So men, imagine we we're there. Men, imagine you're with me at the altar about to get married, and it's time for the rings, and you look over at the best man asking for the rings. He's like, Oh, my bad. I left him back at the house hotel. Or I left him at home. That's not good, right? That's pretty terrible. Or girls in the room. Girls, what if you woke What if you woke up on your wedding day and you had put your wedding dress in a very specific spot? You had it ready to go and you woke up and it was gone. <laughs> oh, it's over. Okay, funny story. This actually happened to my wife on our wedding day. She had gone to get ready and went to go put on the dress, and it was gone. And she's not careless. She knew where it was, or she should have known, or she didn't. Well, you didn't know. It should have been there. But imagine, imagine the anxiety that caused her. Okay, I didn't even know about it until recently. I thought it was funny. But... Thank God she found it where we got married and she was wearing the dress and she looked beautiful. It was awesome. It turned out her mom had taken it to take some pictures with it outside. <laughs> From what I understand, the pictures did look good, so sweet. But hey, we've read about the lost sheep. We've read about the lost coin. 
Let's continue. So to illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons, and the younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. Yikes. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. And a few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. And about the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. And the young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. It's gross. But no one gave him anything. And when he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as your hired servant. So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. And his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet, and kill the calf we have been fattening, for we must celebrate with a feast, for the son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. Let me repeat that again. This son of mine was dead and now has returned to life. He was lost, but now has returned to life or has been found. The son, this is this younger son had been lost. He'd gotten himself lost, but he returned to his father's house and was able to admit that he wasn't worthy of being this man's son. He had messed up, he had screwed up, and he realized it. He had humility. He was able to acknowledge that before his father. But let me tell you, that didn't matter to the father. He quickly had the servants bring his best to put on his son that had returned. And they celebrated, and they had a feast for the son that had come back. And let me give you just a picture of this father. Can you imagine that love and compassion that he had for his boy? But you got to see, he's probably sitting on his porch, and I just wonder how long was he sitting there? waiting. Will my son return? And I just imagine he's, he has almost this villa house, and there's, there's green hills in the distance, and, and the road kind of goes over the hill, and then he's waiting, and he's waiting, and he sees someone come up over the hill, and he's like, is that my son? It's not. And again, it's not my son, and again, and again. But then one day, he looks, and he sees this, man, this person walking down the road. He's like, that's my son. That's my boy. And he couldn't help but run. Now, there's a lot of things known about older men. They aren't particularly known for running. I don't know if you know much about older people. They don't run a lot. But this man saw his son. He couldn't help it. He needed to be be with him. Now, is that how you would respond? Someone comes to you and they say, hey, why don't you just hurry up and die? Or give me what you're going to give me when you die. I want it now. That's not good. Like, like, that's not a fun thing to hear. And then to find out he had taken it and spent it all on wild living, or riotous living, as some translations say. This son had been selfish and foolish and did whatever pleased him in the moment. And he really only returned after his selfish lifestyle left him without money or anyone else to rely on. This, this was somebody who wanted what the father had to give him, not the father's heart. He had no one else to rely on though but this father graciously forgives him and restores him as his son do you ever feel like this son hey bless you do you ever feel like this that you've been living wildly as scripture put it for this guy maybe there's sin in your life that you feel like you can't let go of or maybe that you've been doing that well Trevor I I know God's real but I don't think he'll ever forgive me he'll never accept me back for what I've done I don't know. We just want to leave you there. If you feel like the sun, it's okay. I've been there. Hey, there's some cool percentages found in this passage as well. This is just a fun thought. It's free. For the shepherd, he had lost 1% of his flock, 1 out of 100. 
For the woman, she had lost 10% of her coins, or one out of 10. For the father, he had lost 50% of his sons, one out of two. I just thought that was cool. Now, a lot of these lost things weren't aware that they were lost. The sheep in the story probably didn't know it was lost. The coin certainly didn't. The son only figured it out when the Bible said he came to his senses. And some translations say he, when he came to himself. Have you ever been lost like that? You don't even know why you're doing what you're doing, but you're just doing it. Maybe you're lost. You don't even know it. Could that be true of any of us? I was, and I thank God that he didn't give up on me. And tonight you'll have the same opportunity, opportunity to encounter God like I did. Now, G. Cam Morgan is one of my favorite authors to read, and he refers to this trilogy of stories as the parable of the Father's heart. The parable of the Father's heart. And I like that name a lot for this passage. And I believe, because I do believe that these three stories together create a picture of who God is, of what his heart is like. Now, we talked earlier about the pressure of, of losing your child, the pain that would cause. How much more so do you think does an infinite God feel about losing so many of his precious lost sons and daughters that billions of people are gone, separated from him because of sin and selfishness. Okay, we, sometimes we think that because God's higher than us that somehow he doesn't feel the same pain, he doesn't, under, he doesn't quite have to deal with it. And what I would tell you is actually because he's, because he's God, because he's infinite, because he's eternal, that that pain, that hurt is actually a lot more than what we can imagine. And I tell you this, that he loves you and he cares about you. And there's pain and there's suffering in all of these stories bec- f- for the person who lost that thing because of sin and rebellion. But in each of these stories, there's joy upon finding these lost things. It's evident in each of them, for the shepherd, for the woman, and the father. And let me tell you that this is God's heart for humanity. Jesus wasn't just making up some stories for no purpose. There was a reason he was telling it. He was telling the people listening who God was and how he loves those that are lost. Did you know that? Did you know that God loves you? He values values you. He treasures you. That he desires to seek after each and every single one of us and befriend us and bring us into an eternal relationship with him. That he has joy when we're united with him. Jesus says something a little powerful just a little further in the Gospel of Luke. This is chapter 19, verse 10. And this is right after he's met with Zacchaeus, this really short guy. I don't know if you've ever heard the song from VBS. I'm not going to sing it. But just know. Oh, no, 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 no. I, it's been too long. But just know. I, in the song, they call him Zacchaeus, you wee little man. Come down. I'm coming to your house today. That's all you're going to get. But he was really short. Landon, kind of Landon height maybe. But let me tell you, Landon can climb trees, and so could Zacchaeus. This guy knew how to climb some trees. But he was a short man, and he was a wealthy tax collector. But he was a man who had repented, and he pledged to give away any wealth he had taken wrongly. And Jesus says this after talking to him. He said, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And son of man, that's Jesus' favorite nickname for himself. He said, the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. What was lost? His lost lambs. His precious sons and daughters. And sin and selfishness and all the things of the world separated us from him. But he was going to find us and bring them back into communion with him. And I believe that this is the very purpose of Jesus in coming to this earth and living his life. To seek and to save the lost to restore humanity into a relationship with God, to show that God is a father and he loves us dearly. Now, what about bad fathers? Maybe you're here tonight and you don't have a good relationship with your earthly father or your parents in general. Maybe you're here and you're like, that's great that God's a good father, but I haven't seen that on earth. What does it matter that there's a good God in heaven? I'll I'll tell you this, I struggled with this idea of the father heart of God for a long time. Now, praise God, I had a wonderful mom who's actually here tonight. Thank you, Jesus. And my, and my stepdad, John, thank y'all for being here. But <laughs> um, but let me tell you, my father had left her while she was pregnant with me. 
Um, in fact, he wanted to take her to have an abortion pretty quickly. And she decided and, and said no. And I found out that he had offered to take her and pay for it. And when she told him no, that she was keeping me, he said, then you better not come after me for child support. Because then when I have custody of him, I'll hurt him. I've never met him. And I'm almost 30 years old. I've looked him up on the internet a few times. I've actually found him. I believe it's him at least. And I found that he had two sons. So there's a little bit of pain there. I, I did have a stepdad um, growing up who I can thank for having three younger brothers and, y- and a younger sister. His name was Randy. And he struggled to be a good husband to my mom or a dad to us. He just struggled. And he messed up. Alcohol was a big problem. Money always felt tight. Anger was pretty much a pretty big thing. Not to get too... I just remember one time I accidentally tripped my brother. And I remember he came and he grabbed me by my throat and he held me on the wall and he screamed at me. And he just yelled and he screamed. And that's one of those memories in my life that it's just never going to go away. It's a scar that's there in my heart. But let me tell you, the Lord deals with stuff like that. And he brings healing and he brings redemption. And all the pain that I had about fathers and, and how, you know, growing up in church, you hear that God is a good father and he loves you. And, but I didn't see that. My own father had left my mom. My stepdad was pretty terrible. Also, this isn't the stepdad that's here. John is wonderful. <laughs> to be clear, um, to be clear, John is wonderful. But I remember, I remember growing up, I thought all fathers were like that. That's what I thought they were. And when I heard that God was a good father, I thought, well, that's what he's like. And that's who he is. And I was pretty angry as a kid, and I just hurt all the time. And I just remember wishing, I, I just don't want to be hurt anymore. I don't want to feel pain. But again, thank God that I had a good mom. And thank God that she loved Jesus. Because she made sure that we were in church and that we knew that God loved us. And uh, I struggled with that, and I, I, there was a tension there for a long time in my life. But I remember when I was about 13 years old, I went on this walk, and we lived down a two-and-a-half-mile dirt road. Okay, so we lived back in the woods. One time I told uh, my friend Mariah that we were from the country, and she was like, oh, did you live on a farm or a ranch? I was like, oh, no, we were trailer trash. And <laughs> <laughs> we're so much better than that. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> But, but I remember going on this walk down the dirt road, and I remember it had been raining that night, or that day, and it was just kind of a light rain, it was overcast, and there was some thunder going on, and I remember yelling at the sky. I was so mad, and I was angry with God, and I wanted to let him have it, and I remember saying that I don't believe you're real, and if you are, then you aren't good, because you can't be. You wouldn't allow anything like this to happen to somebody, and I just yelled, and I let him have it, and I told him exactly what I thought. Thank God he didn't strike me down with lightning then. (laughs) But I'll tell you this, God did speak to me. And no, it wasn't an audible voice in the sky, some booming voice, but it was to my heart. And God told me that he loved me, that he cared about me. He's like, you're right, your earthly father has failed you. He said, Trevor, I love you, and I'm going to be a father to you, and I'm going to take care of you. And he has been faithful in that regard all the time. He has always been faithful to, to take care of me. So maybe you're here, and you also had a terrible father, or parents, or just terrible people in your life that they should have cared about you, they should have been good to you. And I want to say that I'm so sorry that happened to you, and I'm so sorry that you've been hurt. But I hope you know that God loves you, and he wants a relationship with you. And all the pain, and all the hurt, and all the suffering, he will deal with it. Let me tell you, when, when Randy, the stepdad, died, I was able to forgive him. And some of the, the pain and the hurt that had been caused in my life, I was able to lay it down and say, no, I'm not going to hold on to this. I'm not going to harbor resentment. I'm not going to let the pain control my life. And it was only because of God. It was only because he dealt with my heart. So if you're carrying some things, you're dealing with some things, and you're blaming all your circumstances and everything you've done because of past hurt, let me tell you, you can, you can lay that down tonight. Like Cody said, we can build an altar. No, not with stones and sticks and everything. But we can meet with God. And we can lay some things down at the foot of the cross and we can say, Lord, I can't hold on to this. I need you to, be, take, I need you to take this from me. 
And we can say sorry for everything that we've done wrong as well. God wants a relationship with you. He wants to give you life, abundant life. But coming back to the parable (laughs) of Luke 15, there's one more part to it, so let me read it real quick. This is right after the son has returned to his father and everything's happened. And it says, Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. And when he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. And he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he was told. And your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. And the older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. And his father came out and begged him. But he replied, All these years I have slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf? His father said to him, Look, dear son, you have always stayed by me, and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day, for your, f- your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now is found. Worship, y'all can actually start coming back up here. But this is the older brother in the story. And you see some pretty ugly things about his character, right? His brother, his younger brother's returned from living a life of sin and selfishness, and he's back, but he's upset and been invited back in the house so easily. Timothy Keller points out that this older brother was just as distant from the father of the story as the younger son. You see, the first son in the story had asked for his share of the inheritance and wasted it. He wanted his stuff instead of a relationship with the father. And the second son mentioned was angry that he hadn't received anything like his brother had just received. He also wanted his stuff instead of a relationship with the father. Again, they're chasing the thing that the father's given. They don't care about his heart or what he cares about. They only want what he's going to give them. It's important to remember when reading this, who was the tar- target audience for this parable? It was the Pharisees, the religious authorities. They had a problem with Jesus befriending sinners and eating with them. And the last part of the story was about them. Let me tell you, some of you, maybe you've encountered Christians in the past. And you saw that they, that they preached a whole lot of stuff, but maybe they didn't always live up to what they said. Maybe they were absolute hypocrites. And they were very religious, and they were very clean on the outside, but you were like, that's ugly. I don't want anything like that. And maybe, maybe they mistreated you. Maybe they treated you wrongly. I'm sorry that happened to you. There's always going to be terrible people in this world. It's a sad fact. Who want to, to, who seem to want the thing God gives, but they don't know his heart. But what God is wanting for each of us is an authentic relationship with him to care about what he cares about, to love what he loves, and to love him dearly. Jesus said, when someone asked him, what is the greatest commandment of, of all, he said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul. And a second that is like it, it says to love your neighbor as yourself. And on on that hangs all the law and prophets. What he's asking for is that we would love him, that we would come to him, And we would love him and not love what he has to give us, not the good gifts, because he's got good stuff, but to love him for for who he is, to love God. Not like the two sons in this parable, and the first one had to learn a pretty hard lesson. Now, maybe you are. Maybe you're dealing with some stuff, and you're, you're, you're doing some things you know you ought not to. And you're spending some of the things that God's given you, and you're doing some of the things that God, like, that life has, has, has blessed you with and you're wasting it. Turn now and turn back to Jesus. Don't live a life in in wild living like it says the younger brother did. You can turn to Jesus now. And honestly, you can make your college years count. Yes, for classes, and yes, you're going to learn more about that next week with with, uh, workplace week. But you can make your time count now and live for Jesus. Be on fire for God and love him dearly. Now, I know that Jesus and the God that's in this Bible that I have love you and want the best for you. So tonight you're here and you have the opportunity to admit where you've messed up in the past and to repent of sin and return to God, to return to the Father. And you can say to God, like the younger son, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. 
and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. You have that ability. Y'all know the most famous verse in the world? Most of you probably do. John 3, 16. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. So that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. So if you're here tonight and you need to talk to God, then know you can do that at your seat or to the sides or up here at the front or in the back. You can make an altar like Cody was talking about and you can meet with God and you can talk to him. And you can give your life right here and now to Jesus. Or maybe you need somebody to pray with you. And most likely the one who brought you here is a small group leader with Chi Alpha. You can go grab them and you can say, I need somebody to pray over me. I need to talk to somebody. If you need to talk to me, I'll be up here as well. And feel free to. But let me pray and then worship. You can lead us. Sound good? All right. Lord Jesus, we love you. I thank you, God, for each and every single student in this room. I thank you, God, for everything you're doing in their lives. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would come and you would fill their hearts with your, with your presence, Lord. I ask, God, that you would bring conviction of sin and selfishness, Father God. I ask that they would see you rightly, Lord. You are so good, Father God. And we love you, Jesus. I ask that right now, Father God, who, God, that these people, they would meet with you, God. We love you, Lord. Would you help us to just set r the right things right, Lord Jesus, to let you be the Lord of our lives. Not stuff, not selfishness, not sin, not, not college, not anything, but you, Lord. We love you, Lord God. Where we see your heart. We love you, Lord God. Amen.